Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to this lecture on edema. In this lecture, I will be discussing about the different types of edema and their causes. Let us begin by defining edema. This is the picture of a capillary and the surrounding cells. The spaces between the cells is known as the interstitium and is normally filled with tissue fluid. Edema is said to be present when there is excess accumulation of fluid in the interstitium. Now let us discuss the different types of edema. Generally when we say edema, we mean extracellular edema where there is accumulation of excess fluid in the interstitium. The other type of edema is intracellular edema where there is fluid accumulation within the cells resulting in cell swelling. In this session I will be discussing mainly about extracellular edema. This is the picture of a capillary, this is the arterial end, this is the venous end. These are the surrounding cells and this is the interstitium and these are the lymphatics. Normally filtration happens at the arterial end so that nutrients can pass from the blood vessel to the cells. Reabsorption usually happens at the venous end so that the waste materials produced by the cells can be taken back. Now the rate of filtration that happens in the arterial end is determined by KF or the filtration coefficient which is dependent on the permeability and surface area of the capillaries. The filtration rate is also dependent on the balance of forces called the stalling forces that operate across the capillaries. So these forces are, one is the capillary hydrostatic pressure or the PC which favors filtration. This pressure is due to the fluid that is present within the capillaries. Another force is the capillary colloid osmotic pressure or the pi C which is due to the presence of proteins within the capillaries and this pressure will favor the reabsorption. The capillary colloid osmotic pressure is also known as the oncotic pressure. PI is the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure that is because of the pressure of the fluid present within the interstitium. This pressure will oppose filtration and favor reabsorption. In reality, the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure is subatmospheric or negative due to the suction effect of the lymphatics that drain excess tissue fluid. And therefore, the interstitial hydrostatic pressure actually favors filtration. Pi I is the interstitial colloid osmotic pressure that is due to the presence of small amounts of proteins that get filtered and normally this force favors filtration. Now the algebraic sum of these forces or these pressures is known as the net filtration pressure. If the net filtration pressure is positive there will be filtration and if the net filtration pressure is negative there will be reabsorption. Now let us discuss the magnitude of the stalling forces in the arterial end of the capillary. So the capillary hydrostatic pressure is about 30 millimeter mercury. The capillary colloid osmotic pressure is 28 millimeter mercury. The interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure is about minus 3 millimeter mercury. And the interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure is about 8 millimeter mercury. Now if we put these values into this equation here, we will get a net filtration pressure of about plus 13 millimeter mercury in the arterial end of the capillary that will favor filtration. Now let us see the magnitude of the stalling forces in the venous end of the capillary. So the capillary hydrostatic pressure at the venous end is about 10 millimeter mercury. 
the other forces are the same as in the arterial end of the capillary. Now, if we put these values into this equation we have here, we will get a net filtration pressure of about minus 7 millimeter mercury which will favor reabsorption at the venous end. So, most of the fluid that gets filtered gets reabsorbed at the venous end in this manner. The remaining fluid is removed by the lymphatic vessels which are present within the tissues and they return this fluid back into the circulation. So, the lymphatic system is very important to prevent excess accumulation of tissue fluid in the interstitium. They also help in returning to the circulation small amounts of proteins that get filtered. Now, let us discuss the causes for extracellular edema. So, extracellular edema can be caused by an increase in capillary permeability, a decrease in capillary oncotic pressure, increase in the capillary hydrostatic pressure and decreased lymphatic drainage. Now, let us discuss the various causes for extracellular edema separately. One important cause for extracellular edema is increased capillary permeability. So, when there is increased capillary permeability, there will be excess fluid filtration happening at the capillaries and this will lead to extracellular edema. So, the capillary permeability is increased by inflammatory conditions where there is release of histamine. Such localized edema can happen with insect bites or bee stings and they usually cause swelling of the affected region. Here we can see an example of a localized edema of the lips. Inflammation of the pleural space or the pericardial space can lead to exudation of fluid from the capillaries into these spaces and can lead to effusions. So, such effusions are usually seen in pericarditis or pleuritis. Another important cause for extracellular edema is a decrease in the capillary oncotic pressure. This will lead to excess filtration at the arterial end and decreased reabsorption at the venous end leading to extracellular edema. So, such edema happens in conditions that decrease plasma protein concentrations like in nephrotic syndrome where there is protein filtration happening in the kidney and these proteins get lost in the urine. Plasma proteins are also decreased in the cirrhosis of liver which will lead to decreased production of these proteins by the liver. Protein malnutrition like in Kwashiorkor can also lead to decrease in plasma protein concentration and thereby can lead to edema. Here we can see the picture of a child with Kwashiorkor. There is severe muscle wasting due to the lack of proteins. There is also pedal edema and distension of the abdomen due to exudation of fluid into the abdominal cavity. An increase in the capillary hydrostatic pressure can also cause edema. Here we have a heart with left ventricular failure and because of the left ventricular failure there is reduced pumping action by the left ventricle and blood starts pooling in the left atria, the pulmonary vein and the pulmonary capillaries. This will increase the pulmonary capillary hydrostatic pressure and cause excess filtration and reduced reabsorption leading to pulmonary edema. The capillary hydrostatic pressure is also increased in right ventricular failure. So, when there is right ventricular failure, there is decreased pumping by the right ventricle and this will lead to increased blood accumulation in the right atria, the veins and the capillaries again leading to an increase in the capillary hydrostatic pressure. This will cause increased filtration and reduced reabsorption of the capillaries and this will lead to generalized edema. Right ventricular failure can also increase the hydrostatic pressure of the mesenteric capillaries and this can lead to exudation of fluid into the abdominal cavity leading to a condition called ascites. Patients with varicose veins of the legs can also have increased capillary hydrostatic pressure and this can lead to pedal edema. Varicose veins result from dysfunction of the venous valves resulting in the accumulation of blood in the lower limbs leading to an elevated capillary hydrostatic pressure and edema. Prolonged stay hunting can lead to edema even in normal individuals because of the pooling of the blood caused by gravity. Walking can prevent this because of the contraction of the skeletal muscles around the leg veins which can propel the blood towards the heart and prevent the pooling of the blood. Edema generally happens in the dependent regions of the body because of the effect of gravity. 
Pedal edema can be reduced by keeping the leg elevated above the level of the heart. Increased in the capillary hydrostatic pressure and edema is also seen in patients with renal diseases like renal failure and glomerulonephritis. So these conditions cause salt and water retention leading to an increase in the blood volume and an increase in the capillary hydrostatic pressure causing edema. The presence of edema can be checked by pressing the edematous region with the thumb for 30 seconds. Here we have the picture of a patient with edema of the lower limbs and the doctor presses the edematous region with the thumb for 30 seconds and after 30 seconds when the thumb is removed we can see that there is a depression of pit formed because of the shift of the fluid from this region to the adjacent regions. Such a type of edema is known as the pitting edema. Another cause for edema is decreased lymphatic drainage. This is caused by conditions like filariasis where the lymphatic vessels are blocked by the filarial parasite. This is the picture of a patient with filariasis of the lower limbs showing edema. This condition is characterized by chronic inflammation leading to fibrosis and therefore the edema can later become non-pitting. Another cause for edema is radical mastectomy where the breast is removed along with the axillary lymph nodes for the treatment of breast cancer. So the removal of the axillary lymph nodes will decrease the lymphatic drainage from the arms leading to edema. So far we have discussed about extracellular edema. Our discussion on edema will not be complete without discussing about intracellular edema. Imagine this is a cell and we know that the cells have sodium potassium pump on the cell membrane which can pump three sodium ions from inside the cell to the outside and take in two potassium ions from outside to the inside. Now this pump requires ATP for its function because the ions are pumped against their concentration gradients. If the cell is exposed to hypoxia due to ischemia then the ATP production will decrease and the sodium potassium pump action will be inhibited leading to an increase in intracellular sodium concentration and water will enter the cell leading to cell swelling and intracellular edema. Hypotonicity of the extracellular fluid can also lead to water entering to the cell and can cause intracellular edema. We have come to the end of our discussion on edema. Now let us summarize what we have learned so far. We said edema can be classified into two types, intracellular edema and extracellular edema. Intracellular edema is caused by conditions like ischemia where there is reduced function of the sodium potassium pump. Extracellular edema can be caused by various conditions. One is increased capillary permeability which is seen in inflammatory conditions. Decreased capillary oncotic pressure can also lead to edema and this is caused by conditions like nephrotic syndrome, liver cirrhosis and quashioka. Edema is also caused by increased capillary hydrostatic pressure due to diseases like renal failure, glomerulonephritis, right ventricular failure, left ventricular failure and varicose veins. Decreased lymphatic drainage can also cause edema and this is seen in conditions like radical mastectomy and filariasis. Thank you for watching this lecture on edema.